Let's take a look at the Accutron Spaceview 2020. This is not a Bulova. This is an independently launched brand from the Citizen Group who also owns Bulova. You will only see Accutron branding on the watch, on the upscale packaging, and of course you will see the classic tuning fork logo. And I think that's a great move. Separating Accutron from Bulova and making it its own independent brand at a higher price I like that. I like that as a watch enthusiast. So what we have here is the world's first electrostatically powered watch movement, which is fascinating. Again, this is not your average quartz. It's not a spring drive. It's nothing like a Grand Seiko. This is entirely new. And as a watch enthusiast, I like to geek out over the tech specs, the specifications, the little nuances and whatnot. So I have had a particularly awesome time with this Accutron, uh, you know, looking at the history, looking at the technology and all of that. So I'd like to thank Royal Jewelers in Andover, Massachusetts for lending this in for presentation. Let's talk about this movement. And I will show you guys some macro shots, some shots of this movement in my watch winder here on the desk outside in natural light. So you can get a good sense of what this is all about, the level of detail and craftsmanship. And then I will also drop in an exploded view of the movement so you can see how complex it is and how nuanced it is. This is the Caliber NS30Y8A. We have 28 jewels, and this is entirely made in Japan by Miyota. And Miyota is the movement arm of the Citizen Group. They provide movements not only to third parties who buy them, but to Citizen for their automatic movements, the Citizen also for the Japan market. So it's a really great, it's a really great movement. And it is done entirely in Nagano Prefecture in Japan. This is accurate to within five seconds per month, which if you think about it, it's not the most accurate quartz movement on the market. This is not going to be as accurate as a The Citizen or a Grand Seiko or a Longines VHP, very high precision. But it is going to be more accurate than your standard solar powered uh, quartz movements or your standard, you know, just your normal quartz movements from, say, ETA, what's in my Tissot PRX. And the movement accuracy is not the draw here. The smooth second sweep is one of the draws here. The power saving mode is one of the draws to this movement. But the biggest draw is the fact that the movement utilizes twin turbines, which you guys can see here on the dial, that spin with just normal motion as you wear this watch and you're going about your day-to-day -day activities that's going to spin these twin turbines and the turbines are connected to electrodes that generate the static electricity that static electricity is then stored and used by a pair of motors one of the motors is a standard electrostatic and that powers the running seconds hand here that lovely smooth sweep that some people say have no soul. You got to see the tick, right? I'm not one of those guys at all, uh, but that's one of the motors. And then the other motor is a traditional step motor and that powers the hour hand and the minute hand. Now all of the timekeeping, it's all synchronized through one quartz circuit and you can see it expansively through this bubble sapphire crystal. So uh, honestly, it's, it's really cool to look at. I like how innovative this is. No more batteries, no need for solar charging, just the concept of motion perpetuated quartz like accuracy in a wristwatch. You know, it's most similar to spring drive, although a spring drive and this electrostatic powered movement, ah, just vastly different, completely different. But the concept is, is really cool. It's innovative. And I like the cutting edge thought process here and taking it and making it appear visually like the roots of Accutron back in the mid 1960s. And I'll drop in a picture of the original space view from 1965. So it blends the history, the heritage with cutting edge technology. I don't know. I, I think that's awesome. I can geek out a little bit as a watch enthusiast looking at this. Now let's, let's talk a, a little bit about the features here because we do have that power saving mode. And let me explain that when the watch is motionless, if it's static, if it's sitting 
for five continuous minutes, then the power saving mode is activated. The seconds hand will just stop at the 12 o'clock position. And then that step motor powering the hour and minute hands that will continue to keep the time perfectly. And then once you pick up the watch or you start moving again, you start uh, wearing the watch around and you begin charging that electrostatic seconds hand motor, the seconds hand will return to the proper time that the movement has been keeping track of through that court circuit. And so sometimes again, you'll look at your wrist and you'll see that seconds hand just standing at sitting, excuse me, at the 12 o'clock position. It's not broken. It's just in power saving mode. And then you move your arm, move it around. Uh, the, the citizen group says three to five seconds will get it moving. And then you'll see that second hand start to move. And in my experience, it moves very, very slowly. You know, it could be moving at the speed of half, you know, two seconds for every one second in reality. And you think, man, what's going on? Is this thing broken? Well, no, it's just waiting for that, that perfect second to get to the right position on the dial. And then that second hand starts moving you know, and that continuous, smooth, buttery, smooth sweep uh, in perfect timekeeping, in synchronization. And so it's fun to see that process play out. And I managed to capture it with one of my shots here. And so I'm going to show that to you right now. So pretty interesting. I like seeing that. This is fun. This is a watch enthusiast piece that you don't get tired of looking at. You like seeing the little movement in the turbines attached to the electrodes. You like seeing the green and the orange accent colors that were dominant in that original space view from the 1960s. It's great to see. This is a conversation piece. So if you're around non-watch enthusiasts on a regular basis, this would be a good watch to wear because it's eye grabbing. People will notice it. And they can go, hey, what's going on there? What's up with all that? <laughs> what's up with all those things on the watch? And you can say, hey, this is the first electrostatically powered watch movement. You don't have to go overboard explaining where it's manufactured, the accuracy rate per month, the power saving mode or anything like that, because I think this is interesting enough visually and then hearing the concept where it can pique the interest of a lay person and maybe get them into watches. I think that's pretty cool. So let's continue with the review here. We have 50 meters of water resistance. We have a bubble sapphire crystal, and then we have a calfskin leather strap with a deployant clasp. Overall dimensions are 43.5 nominally in diameter, and then we have 49.3 in overall lug to lug length with a tall 16 millimeter height 22 millimeter is the lug width. So is this comfortable on wrist? Yes, it's it's perfectly comfortable on wrist. Is it tall? Is it large? Absolutely. But that is part of the charm here. That's part of the draw. You want to look at this movement through this massive bubble crystal. It's an expansive view. You're seeing it from various angles. You're getting a little bit of distortion. So this more so is about the aesthetics and the presentation than it is about scaling it down and making it uh, more traditionally sized on wrist, if that makes sense. So I do like that. Uh, we have a milled case back, which you guys can see carries a turbine texture, you know, uh, around the circumference. And then we have the Accutron tuning fork logo in the center with the Accutron branding. I like to see that. Let's talk about negative elements here. I think some people will say this is entirely too expensive. I would never spend $3,000 on an Accutron. If I had $3,000, i am buying a Longines. I'm buying a, a Manta. I'm buying, you know, whatever, a used Black Bay, whatever I can get. And I understand that. I don't necessarily think this watch is for uh, the new watch enthusiast, where if you're stepping up into that price category, you want some prestige, you want some pop on your wrist, right? You want to be able to flex a little bit and say, yes, I've got some name cachet that some people might recognize. But I think if you've already had that phase, if you've moved past that and you're just looking for watches that are cool, that you connect with, that are conversation pieces, that are different from the masses of black bays on the market, right? That are being posted on social media. Again, nothing wrong with that. 
I've had those days myself, no judgment from me, then this is one that you might want to consider because it is really cool, but it is expensive. I recognize that. Uh, but you're not going to get this type of R&D, this technology, a world's first you know, for $500. That's just not going to happen. So I recognize the price segment here. I do think it's appropriate, even though it, it is pretty stiff and it will hurt the wallet if you were to pull the trigger. So I think this also suffers from the fact that the Sapphire Crystal does not carry great anti-reflective treatment. Anytime you get a watch where you want to showcase the dial, you want people to stop and stare. You want people to take out a loop or uh, put on a macro lens on their phone, a clip-on lens, and spend some time looking at the dial, looking at the details. You want good anti-reflective treatment. You want to enhance the clarity. And there are some brands that just do a fantastic job like Breitling, Omega, IWC, and then other brands that just do not care about doing anti-reflective treatment. And I'm one of those um, proponents of excellent anti-reflective treatment on almost any type of watch that I can get with few exceptions. And so I think that could improve this particular piece. And then I recognize I, I might be sounding nitpicky and we can get completely nitpicky as watch enthusiasts. And I try to remember this, this hobby is entirely subjective. There is no one set of rules that we can judge all watches by. Uh, but personally, I'd like to see a bracelet option. I know historically the Accutron you wanted to wear that on leather. So I get it, right? I definitely get that. But personally, I would want a bracelet, especially if I'm spending over $3,000 on a watch. I think that helps bring some value. And again, I'm just kind of a bracelet dog myself. So guys, that's my presentation of the Accutron Space View 2020. It's not a Bulova. It is really lovely. It's really interesting. It's a conversation piece. It's loud. And not to mention, we have an upscale package here uh, when it comes to the watch presentation box, which I think is a great move. If you're going to charge more, you know, than, than maybe watch fans are used to for this name, you're going to have to bring the extras, sweeten the deal a little bit. And the box is actually really nice, far nicer than any other Citizen Group product that I've seen to date. So again, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much for watching today. And if you're shopping for an Accutron, I'm going to put you in touch with Bill at Royal Jewelers in Andover, Massachusetts. They're the authorized dealer that lent this one in for a video presentation. Bill's contact is in the description. He's not on commission, so it's a no pressure environment. He's just there to help you if you want to order one, add one to the collection, put your name on the warranty, all of that good stuff. It's in the description. Have a great day and I'll see you real soon.